Well, thank you, everyone. Um, as you say, in here, I'm a theoretical physicist, and I'm working on cancer. And this is what I'm going to talk about today. So here, I'm going to start with an observation that was done in 1953 by a statistician. So it's a guy that didn't know anything about cancer. But he was just looking at the number of people who were dying from different cancers. And there was something that everyone knows here, is that usually older people, they die much more from cancer than younger uh, people. But as a statistician, uh, he was counting exactly the numbers. So, and he was counting how many people were dying from cancer at age 10, 20, 30 years old, and, on, and so on. And he did this plot here in four different countries. And one was the United States, United Kingdom, France, and Norway. And he was doing something that we do a lot in, uh, in, in science, that you do a lock-lock plot. And he found something very interesting, is that every country, they follow the same rule. So people, older people, they are from cancer, but the numbers, they are exactly in the same fashion. They are always a, like a straight line in a lock-lock plot. And that means that you can calculate, basically, if you know how many people die from age 20 of a particular cancer, you can know how many people are going to die from age 60. And there was this particular law. There was the time, there was 1953, there was the time where people uh, speculated that the origin of cancer was through mutations. And then he conjectured, he put the theory, and saying that if there is only one mutation that caused the cancer and you have one cell there, then if you just wait and there is a random process with a random mutation rate, at some point it will happen, independently of what is the age. If there were two mutations that caused the cancer, then you can follow and it's going to be a linear with age. So he looked at the slope and he saw that the slope was around seven. Six, seven. So he conjectured that you need at least six or seven mutations in a particular cancer to, to happen. So that was in 1953, and uh, cancer genomics was developed during this time, and it has been a very painful process. I mean, identifying the first tumor suppressors and oncogenes has been like in the last uh, 60 years, has been a process that has been very slow. It has dramatically changed in the last five years. It has changed because the technology has changed. We have now sequencers that you can take your DNA and then you can just sequence the DNA. And my students, for example, in my lab, now they take the list of, of mutations and I'm going to show some of the lists. And every of the students, they look at tons of mutations. And many of the things that were very painful took years to identify a particular gene, just doing familial studies and all these things. Now it's in, in basically within a, within a month. So here's a cartoon. It's a cartoon of how a cancer evolves. Then uh, there's a guy there that has a cancer. Time is running from left to right. And they are normal cells. We have trillions of normal, 10 trillion normal cells in our body. And they are mutations. Mutations happen randomly. Okay? Most of our cells, they are going to be different. They are going to have a mutation in a particular place or something like that. At some point, there are some mutations that happen. And there is a clonal expansion. So some of these cells tend to replicate more than the rest. And then you have this kind of orange-pink uh, expansion. And this is the diagnosis of, of, of the cancer. So now, if you want to sequence and uh, you sequence, then you can yes, get your genome and there's some therapy. You can do some radiotherapy or some particular targeted therapy if you know uh, if there's some targetable alteration. And then the tumor can shrink. And for some years, you don't see that. And then at some point, it will relapse. You sequence again and then trying to understand what are the mutations that causes the relapse. There are some salvage therapy that uh, you apply. And then at some point, there are metastasis and complications and all these things. This is a typical pattern that we see. So this is what I call the standard model of cancer. This is how we understand uh, how cancer evolves. The time is running from left to right again here, and there is a normal cell. This is the blue ball that is on the left, and there are random mutations that happen. Most of our cells, they have mutations that, that happened. They are not bad mutations. There at some point, there is this red mutation that happened and leads to a clonal expansion. So the cells start to replicate, and other mutations start to accumulate. And then when you have the right combination or the wrong combination of mutations is when the cancer appears. So this is what we call a clonal process, because there is a clone amplification, and it's Darwinian. What you have is a competition between different clones that are kind of growing and growing and growing. And it's, um, this competition happens in a particular environment, and this is the selection pressures that we have. So this is very Darwinian evolution, where there are treatment, different treatments, they select for different alterations. There is immune surveillance, there is invasion of different tissues. This is how it happened. So when we are doing genomics, what we are doing is taking pictures of this process. We are taking the pictures of normal cells, we are taking pictures of primary tumors, they are relapsed tumors, and many different things, different metastases. And then we try to see how these mutations fit together. The thing is that, uh, and this is um, why now, physicists or mathematicians will start uh, joining here the thing, 
is that uh, this uh, sequencing produces a lot of data. So it's very complex. I'm going to show some examples, and it's highly non-trivial. So imagine you have your patient here, you sequence and you get tons of data. So the data is enormous. It's like 100,000 volumes. So the doctor is coming here and gives you 100,000 volumes and is telling you, look for the particular mutation that caused the cancer. So you have to start doing statistics and a lot of different things. At the end, what we are doing is uh, creating algorithms and a way to look for the data for finding a small list. A small list that at the end is what is going to be the informative information about the mutations that caused this cancer. Okay, so I'm going to give you an example. It was one of the first examples that we look, and it's a very nice example because it's very didactical. Uh, I think is um, this is a, call, a circles plot. It's a very nice way of representing tumors and very standard in many papers. So here there are nine patients of this particular type of leukemia. Each of these circles, uh, these concentric circles, represent a patient. So there is a blue patient here in the middle. There is a pinkish uh, patient, orange, I don't know, uh, green. Uh, uh, orange, yellow, magenta, different patients. So there are nine circles here. And then here on the outside is representing uh, the whole genome. So this is chromosome 1, chromosome 2, chromosome 3, blah, 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 blah. I am not writing here the chromosome Y, but there are all the chromosomes here except for the Y. And then when there is a mutation, we just mark it here. So for example, the blue guy here, they have several mutations. There are around 20 mutations per patient, and there are one mutation that happened here in the beginning of chromosome 3, another mutation in chromosome 4, and this is a typical pattern that we find. Leukemias, they are usually very clean. They have very few mutations. These are protein-changing mutations. Then you look at another patient, so another patient, and you have another report where you have another 20 mutations. And then you have another pattern of mutations. You can see that there are basically no things in common. I mean, this is very standard things in, in these cancers. And then you have another patient, another patient, another patient. So you have, in this case, nine patients, and then you try to see things that are in common. And, uh, well, in the moment that you start uh, paying attention, you realize that there are things in common here. And in particular, in chromosome 7, this is a histogram, so this is counting how many times a particular gene is altered. They are all the patients that have a particular mutation. So it's very interesting to us, it was this particular mutation in chromosome 7. And this is in a particular gene, this code is very interesting, it's BRAF, that is mutated in many melanomas. It's half of the melanomas, they have mutations there, and other tumors. And then there are drugs that have been developing for that particular mutation. And then one of the things that is very interesting is now we can take these drugs and apply them to these patients, because they are very specific for that. So uh, now what happened when we go to other tumors? So the story is much more complex. These are 150 patients of uh, glioblastoma, which is a very deadly brain tumor, one of the most common ones. And then now there are many circles. So there is 150 circles here. This is why you cannot distinguish by eye each of the patients. But um, there are patterns. There are patterns hidden here. And this is what we are looking at. There are some of the things that are known, and one can describe here several things that are known, but many, many things, they are not known there. So um, one of the things that is clear is each of these patients is different. So they have a different spectrum, but they are common things. So um, one of the things that we are discovering is in every tumor, there are basically no tumors with two mutations, exactly the same mutational spectrum, they are different. So what we are doing, and my group and other groups, is finding ways first to identify the mutations, the second one, when you have many different patients, like these 150 glioblastoma patients, is trying to find what is the pattern of mutations. It's like being in the stock market and trying to see exactly what are the things going up and down and trying to find the right combination that is giving you the, the winning uh, or the losing uh, <laughs> uh, lot. And, and the other thing is just once you have this right combination, is trying to find if there is a possible strategy, or uh, therapy, or a way of prognostic uh, in these things. So um, and this is, for example, patterns in, in these uh, differences. This is in leukemias. We were following thousands of patients with uh, uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And then when we are following in time, we can just define what are the roots of mutations. So there are some mutations that happen in the beginning of the tumor, some of these that happen later, and some of those. So there are different paths that uh, uh, patients can follow when they're accumulating mutations. And this is one of the things that we are starting to to do. So this is, um, this is the work of many people. It's a big community now that is exploring these issues. As you can imagine, it's very interesting. And um, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>